My name is Eli, and this is Murder in the Morning. My sources for today come from my religious textbook, Ranker.com, The Guardian, FBI, FBI FBI.gov, and the rest I'll list below. I wanted to do something special today, and I think I found the perfect story after a bit of digging. I kept asking myself, who or what is the perfect killer? What is the perfect killer? Not just like a certain person, but no matter their age, preference, MO, victim profile, what is one thing that stands out above the rest? Long haul truck drivers. Now, you don't have to agree with me, of course, I'm just a dude, but I challenge you to find me anyone else in a better position to kill. Police officers, you might argue, sure, but look at Stephanie Lazarus, or John Christie, or Joseph D'Angelo, or any number of law enforcement officers who have been killers and have been caught. Their ego becomes their downfall. They believe they're above the rest untouchable, smarter than the average murderer. But they don't move around. They're slow, they're sloppy sometimes. Their tracks can be followed. No, not cops, not police officers. Truck drivers, I'm telling you. According to the FBI's website, if there is such a thing as an ideal profession for a serial killer, it may as well be a long-haul truck driver. FBI crime analyst Christy P is quick to point out that long-haul truck driving is an honorable profession and that the overwhelming majority of drivers are not murderers. But it does happen, and the pattern is unmistakable. More than a decade ago, analysts for the FBI's Violent Criminal Apprehension Program, or VICAP, the only national database of serial crimes, began to see a marked increase in the number of bodies recovered along the side of the road a majority of the victims were truck stop sex workers, and it turned out that many of the suspects were long-haul truckers. Christie explained, We had an inordinate number of victims and offenders from this rather specific population pool. To make matters worse, these cases are extremely difficult to investigate. A long-haul truck driver can pick up a sex worker at a truck stop in Georgia, rape and murder her, and dump her body on the side of the road in Florida later the same day. The victim has no connection to the area where she was found, and there may be no forensic evidence to collect because the crime was committed hundreds of miles away. The local police investigating this case might not have much experience dealing with a crime of this nature and may be faced with few, if any, leads. Without VICAP, local law enforcement agencies investigating one of these cases may have no way of knowing a murder in their jurisdiction is similar to killings committed elsewhere. Since the initiative began, FICAP analysts have compiled a list of more than 750 murder victims found along or near U.S. highways, as well as nearly 450 potential suspects. These analysts also began to develop detailed timelines for many of the suspects. The information in the timelines, obtained from company logs, gas station receipts, and other records, helps investigators pinpoint where a suspect was when the murders were committed. Christie says, it's not unusual for a driver to pass through five or even seven states in one day. The amount of ground they cover and the lack of any connection to where they're passing through makes it difficult to tie cases back to them. So the timeline becomes crucial to investigators. The goal for VICAP analysts is to obtain as many records from as many sources as possible to determine a driver's whereabouts at fixed points in time. Christie says those details are what what will ultimately help tie the suspect back to the murders. And in the 12 years since its creation, the Highway Serial Killings Initiative and VICAP has helped many local police police departments solve violent sexual assaults and murder cases. But Christie cautioned that many more victims demand justice and these highly mobile killers are not going to disappear. According to the Department of Transportation, Christie stated, the number of truck drivers on the road in the next 20 years is going to grow exponentially. So, 
if we've already identified a population from which we are getting a significant number of offenders, and if we are going to be seeing more and more trucks on the road, the potential for additional highway serial killings is definitely there. So yeah, truck drivers, see? The hard part for me today was finding a story most of us haven't heard before. And I believe I did. I think. I hope. We'll see. On February 17th, 1991, Joseph Darren Jr., a divorced father and data supervisor for Blue Cross Blue Shield, went missing. He disappeared after dropping off his two daughters at their mother's house just outside Clermont County, Clermont County, Ohio. Two days later, a co-worker would file a missing persons report after he failed to show up for work. Police officers were on high alert for Darren or his 1988 white Subaru. After a few weeks had passed, officers were notified that Darren's credit cards had been used upwards of 25 times. But not only that, around the same time, they received multiple reports of witnesses spotting his white Subaru in Portland and Idaho. Just over a month later in March, a motorist pulled off the road in Anderson Township, 13 miles outside of Cincinnati, Ohio. He spotted the body of a a deceased man and called authorities. Judging by his description, they quickly determined him to be Joseph Darren Jr., and his cause of death was that of a gunshot wound. The investigation began to escalate at this point. Our perpetrator had been dumb enough to continue using Darren's credit cards and his car and police have been tracking his movements as best as they could. It's unclear precisely when, but Ohio police received a description of the man from authorities on the West Coast. This description was detailed enough for them to get a name. Their suspect was John Fountainberry. On March 17th, Fountainberry was arrested at his hotel room in Juneau, Alaska. As the suspect in only one murder investigation, Authorities were not ready for this man to suddenly confess to a total of six killings. Quote, born on July 4th, 1963 in New London, Connecticut, Fountainberry's father was a former Marine and a former police officer. His parents divorced shortly after his younger sister was born. Rejected by his father and grandparents, young John was placed into the care of his mother, who went on to marry twice more. He was, he was ignored by both of his stepfathers, suffered beatings for the smallest of mistakes, and even once for confusing a potato salad with tomato salad. I mean, that's pretty fucking dumb, but you don't gotta beat a kid. According to Fountainberry, he would use an imaginary hammer to nail his and his sister's blankets to the bed in an effort to not get taken away by malicious forces. The family often changed residences, shifting between Ohio and Hawaii before mo- before moving to North Kingston in Rhode Island in 1950 nope 1983 by that time John Fountainberry had already had run-ins with the law he had stolen a 1968 Chrysler in Atlanta but was later captured in Heflin Alabama after leaving a gas station without paying for gas it's always the small mistakes that'll get you in 1985 his mother died of cancer leaving Fountainberry to become even more disillusioned and untrusting of people, with him even developing a growing addiction to drugs and alcohol. In order to support himself, he found several short-term jobs as a long-haul truck driver traveling all across the United States, but was often fired for for, for for poor performance and negligence. By the time his murders began, he acquired several more convictions for minor offenses, including carrying a concealed weapon in Ohio, and a public disturbance charge in Connecticut. With the help of his birth father, he moved to Portland, Oregon in 1986. Shortly after arriving in Portland, John's father moved out of the house, wanting seemingly nothing to do with him. At the time, Fountainberry started having an affair with his stepmother. Her name was Olivia Herndon. John Fountainberry's father finally got a divorce from this Olivia lady, and John Fountainberry 
and her continued their relationship for many years. While they never married, they were together for nearly 15 years, even while he was incarcerated. End quote. I mean, ew. He literally dated his stepmother. I mean, some of you weirdos out there are probably jealous. The first time Fountainberry committed murder was in 1990. He happened to cross paths with a 47-year-old man named Donald Nutley, a.k.a. Nut, from Waco, Texas, at a truck stop just outside Troutdale, Oregon. Nutley told John that he was headed up to Mount Hood for some shooting practice and asked if he would like to join. Fountainberry obliged, and the two began their trek through the woods. While Nutley's back was turned, John pulled out his gun and shot the man in the head. His disappearance remained a mystery until April 21, 1991, when his teeth and skull, complete with a bullet hole, were found in a wooded area of Mount Hood. The following year, according to Wikipedia, on February 1st of 1991, Fountainberry encountered 27-year-old fellow trucker Gary Farmer. Gary was from Springfield, Tennessee, and they met at a pilot truck stop in Bloomsbury, New Jersey, not far from the I-78. According to Fountainberry, Farmer allegedly made unwanted sexual advances on him, and in retaliation, he killed him and robbed him. Fountainberry left his body in the truck's sleeping compartment, and he was found on February 5th and remained unidentified for a few days. After his identity was recovered, authorities released a sketch of a man wanted for questioning in his death. According to his employers, Gary Farmer was on a cross-country route bound for Hunterdon County at the time of his death. And at the time of the murder, Fountainberry was traveling towards Zion, Illinois, and had stopped at the truck stop to have breakfast. Sixteen days after killing Gary is when he encountered Joseph Darren Jr. Posing as a hitchhiker, Fountainberry was picked up by the good-natured Darren who proceeded to kill him and rob him afterwards. Using Darren's car, Fountainberry crisscrossed through several states before finding himself at a party in Portland on February 23rd, where he met 32-year-old local bank teller Christine Ann Guthrie, or Guthrie. She agreed to accompany John to the Coastal Silver Sands Motel in Rockaway Beach, where the pair were seen by hotel owner Anna Modrell. Following their meetup, Guthrie vanished. Her body was found on April 1st near the remote logging community of Timber, and she had died from gunshot wounds to the head. From there, quote, Fountainberry drove to Seattle, Tacoma International Airport specifically, abandoning Darren's car there at the parking lot. He bought a one-way ticket to Juneau, Alaska, arriving on March 2nd or 3rd, finding work on a fishing boat, and moving into the downtown Bergman Hotel. On March 14th, he was hanging out at a rural bar, having been fired from his most recent job at the fishing boat, when he came across 39-year-old Jefferson Diffie, a miner who worked at the Greens Creek Silver Mine. The two struck up on a conversation, and Diffie, feeling sorry for the newcomer, who wasn't yet accustomed to the Alaskan wilderness, invited Fountainberry to his condo. There, John Fountainberry proceeded to beat him, and stab him 17 to 18 times before stealing his wallet, credit card, and 9mm handgun. And the following day, he withdrew $400 from Diffie's bank account. In the meantime, co-workers had filed a missing persons report for Jefferson Diffie, who hadn't come back into work for two days, which was quite unlike him. As well positioned as Fountainberry was, he's just so dumb. At this point, he's been using the credit cards and bank accounts of two separate dead and missing people. Finally, three days after killing Diffie, John Fountainberry was arrested in his Juno hotel room. He was indicted for the murders of Diffie, Gary Farmer, and Joseph Darren, and was first to stand trial in Alaska. In exchange for the other charges being dropped, he pleaded guilty to the killing of Diffie, and was given a 99-year prison, prison sentence in Alaska. Then, he was extradited to Ohio, where he was sentenced to death for the murder of Joseph Darren, and sent off to await execution at the Southern Ohio Correctional Facility. 
But then in September of that year, he was extradited to New Jersey, where he pleaded guilty to the murder in the Gary Farmer case and was given a life sentence in that state. While in custody, police looked into other possible murder connections, including the Dr. No murders, but his MO and victim profile were too far off. During his imprisonment, Fountainberry was profiled as a serial killer according to the FBI's definition, with newspapers drawing comparisons to other murders such as Ted Bundy. Fountainberry himself denied being one, as he believed he didn't fit the criteria because he murdered for money, not for sexual or personal satisfaction. Every single appeal or bid made by Fountainberry was immediately denied, and on July 14th, he was executed by lethal injection at an Ohio correctional facility. And that, my friends, is the story of the truck driving serial killer, John Fountainberry. Woo! I had a lot of fun with that one. Well, as much as you can, I guess, in a not weird, morbid way. In a morbid, weird way. And I hope you did too. I only hope the FBI can find more and more resolutions for the countless un- unidentified victims or killers along our interstates and highways. The U.S. is just so freaking rotten with them. Fun fact, the greatest distance Fountainberry traveled between victims was 2,860 miles, or 4,603 kilometers. And I think, I think that'll about do it. Hang around a bit after the world's okayest outro for another little extra bit today. Thank you all once again for tuning in, and I hope to see you on the next episode. Okie dokie. Bye bye. Love you. Hey, hey. I love this part of the episode. It feels, it just feels so much more relaxed and almost like I'm learning alongside you. Well, I am. I mean, I don't know any of this stuff off the top of my head. I do a bunch of research. This article was written in 2007 by Ian Trainer of The Guardian. Quote, a Polish pulp fiction writer was sentenced to 25 years in jail yesterday for his role in a grisly case of abduction, torture, and murder, a crime he then used for the plot of a best-selling thriller. In a remarkable case that has gripped Poland for months, Christian Bala, a writer of blood-curdling fiction, was found guilty of orchestrating the murder of a Rokla businessman, businessman seven years ago named Darius Jana, Januski. These are going to be some tough Polish pronunciations. I am so sorry. Darius J. He killed him in a crime of passion brought on by the suspicion that the victim was sleeping with his ex-wife. In the novel, the villain gets away with kidnapping mutilating, and murdering a young woman. In real life, however, Christian Bala got his comeuppance, even though it was seven years after the the disappearance of the man. The killing of Darius J. was one of the most gruesome cases to come before a Polish court in years, with the murder he wrote subplot unfolding in the district court in Roklaw and keeping the country spellbound. Darius who was said to have been having an affair with Bala's ex-wife, was scooped out of the river Oder near Rokla in southwest Poland by fishermen in December 2000, four weeks after going missing. The police test revealed that he was stripped almost naked and tortured. His wrists had been bound behind his back and tied to a noose around his neck before he was dumped in the river. The police had little to go on. Within six months, Commissioner Jacek Jacek Robluski, leading the investigation, dropped the case. It remained closed for five years, despite the 2003 publication of Amok, a book written by Christian Bala of a gory tale about a bunch of bored sadists, with the narrator, Chris, recounting the murder of a young woman. The details of the murder matched those of Darius's almost exactly. Christian Bala, who sometimes used the first name Chris on his frequent frequent jaunts abroad, was arrested in 2005 after Commissioner Robluski 
received a tip about the, quote, perfect crime and was advised to read this novel thriller. But Christian was released after three days for insufficient evidence, despite the commissioner's conviction that he had his villain. When further evidence came to light, Bala was re-arrested. The case against him, however, remained circumstantial. Police uncovered evidence that Christian had known the dead man, dead man, had telephoned him around the time of his disappearance, and then had sold the dead man's mobile phone on the internet within days of the murder. When Poland's TV equivalent of Crime Watch or 48 Hours aired details of the case in an attempt to generate fresh police leads, the program's website received messages from various places in the Far East, places where Christian Bala, a keen scuba diver, was discovered to have been visiting at the time of the messages. All along, Bala protested his innocence, insisting that he derived the details for his thriller from media reports of the Darius murder. But it was too late. Judge Lydia sentenced Christian Bala to 25 years in jail and admitted that he could not be found directly guilty of carrying out the murder, but the evidence sufficed, but the evidence was sufficient enough to find him guilty of planning and orchestrating the crime. She was quoted saying, The evidence gathered gives sufficient basis to say that Christian Bala committed the crime of leading the killing of Darius Janinizewski. The court heard expert and witness evidence that Christian was a control freak, eager to show off his intelligence, even, quote, pathologically jealous and inclined to sadism. The judge went on to say he was extremely jealous of his wife. He could not allow his estranged partner to have ties with another man, end quote. He was so, so close to the perfect crime, so close to getting away, just not close enough. Apparently, the movie starring Jim Carrey called Dark Crimes is about this, and I had no idea, and I never watched it because I, I didn't know what it was about, but I'm, I think I'm going to. And that, my friends, is the story of author-turned-murderer Christian Bala, or murderer-turned-author, my apologies, best-selling author. Once again, a very, very Merry Christmas to everyone who is celebrating. And thank you, as always, for taking the time out of your day to listen to me. I think that one may have been a little bit longer. We'll see how much I have to actually cut out. I fucking suck at speaking sometimes. Okie dokie. Bye-bye. Love you all.